People are guarded. They are waiting for the next catalyst. I'm surprised and disappointed that this situation has continued to linger as long as it has. These are things are like forest fires. It is much easier to prevent them than it is to contain them. I think any disruption in, in banking is something to be alert to. We're watching carefully. We're uh, there to be helpful if we need to, but so far things seem to be underhand. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. Good morning, it's 5 a.m. in New York, 10 a.m. in London, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today, uh, for the most part, we're focused on First Republic. Regulators just taking over First Republic. They will sell it to J.P. Morgan Chase. Rescue efforts couldn't fix the damage caused by bad investments as well as depositor runs. Also, waiting for Apple. It tops a list of companies reporting earnings this week. Analysts are waiting to see whether the world's most valuable public company sold more iPhones than expected. And we're waiting, of course, on the Fed's next move. The central bank will announce its latest decision on interest rates Wednesday. Friday's jobs report could give us a hint about what will happen after that because uh, another move really is in play if you look at um, if you look at unemployment not so much if you look at banks let's take a look uh, on here on Bloomberg surveillance early edition I'm Matt Miller in New York by the way Anna Edwards is off um, for the May Day holiday let's take a look at what's going on with markets this morning because we waited all weekend for this first Republic issue to be solved a lot of people must have been checking um, uh, the news wires every hour or so S&P futures are unchanged and you really have a mixed market because Dow futures are up right now and Nasdaq futures are down a little bit deeper so tech stocks may be losing a little bit more in the pre-market this morning uh, the US 10-year yield right now rising so investors selling the bonds, selling futures, uh, and they're selling crude futures as well. Uh, WTI at 75.14, continued concerns about demand in China just not materializing even after the strong uh, Labor Day week spending, well, spending to kick off the Labor Day week. Of course, today is Labor Day in most parts of the world, not in the U.S. And then Bitcoin down $766. This, I think, is uh, a precursor to what could be a bigger drop on the NASDAQ than we see on the other uh, benchmarks today because, of course, Bitcoin is more heavily correlated with those tech stocks, and it falls further when tech stocks see weakness, $28,500. $81. The main story, though, really front and center, what we've been waiting for since Friday, J.P. Morgan has won the bidding to take over the troubled First Republic Bank. The FDIC ran the sale after private rescue efforts failed to make up for bad investments, a lot of them in mortgages, and a run on First Republic's deposits, uh, many of those, I think about 50 percent, above the FDIC insurance limit. Bloomberg's Simone Foxman joins us now for more. So, Simone, what do we know about the details um, that have just really come out fresh off the wire of this agreement? Well, this is certainly not what the FDIC wanted. It's not that clean acquisition that they had looked for for the past couple of weeks. And therefore, the FDIC is going to share in the burden to the tune of $13 billion. But if we look at J.P. Morgan shares this morning, this is potentially positive for the bank because they see this generating a $500 million worth of net income each year. They expect to initially take some $2.6 billion added value, but see about $2 billion worth of restructuring costs over the next 18 months. And then, of course, if we look at the shares of First Republic shareholders, they're a little bit concerned about what they may get out of it, if anything. And that's why we're seeing such a hit to the stock price this morning, down over 40 percent. That's right. Year to date, down 97 yeah. percent. Um, but it still could get worse, right? We're looking at the shares trading, I think, around $2 um, right now in the pre-market. So they've up, about halved their value since the close on Friday. Uh, it, it's not all about First Republic, right? Or, I mean, maybe 
indirectly. <laughs> um, the Fed decision is kind of going to be about that. But we also have earnings heavy, right? 162 S&P 500 companies are reporting this week. Yeah, busy week last week, busy week this week. And so far, the results showing a lot of strength in the economy. If you look at the S&P 500, it's looking at sales growth. 181 companies reporting positive sales growth so far in this earnings season, compared to only 74 reporting negative sales growth. And those largely con uh, contained in the materials sector. Um, so a heavier split towards these earnings surprises. Yes, we're seeing overall on top line numbers outperform as we typically do. I know you pointed that out last week, hmm. but you know, even the sales growth showing, you know, strong activity in the country. Um, AMD, uh, Qualcomm, Apple, those are the big tech names that we're looking for this week. They come out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, respectively. Also looking at things like Ford, where the margins really have been under pressure, um, potential to be drawn into a price war with Tesla. That's going to be something that analysts are focusing on. Uh, and then we'll get stuff like Peloton, where we expect to see subscriber numbers actually fall for the first time uh, ever, really. And so yep. there's going to be a lot of different interesting things at play, not just about the consumer, but also um, about tech. And, and of course, forward. Apple coming out at the end of the week. Berkshire Hathaway is the last one to report. I think on Saturday they come out with their earnings traditionally. Yeah, they're weir a weird one. They're yeah. <laughs> rare, rare company that comes out over the weekend. So we're waiting for the Fed decision on Wednesday, obviously, but there are still a number of data points even after that that investors are going to want to be be paying close attention to. Yeah, we have a busy week here because we start off today, ISM manufacturing, PMI, and um, this is something that economists expect essentially to be steady, but we really get into the meat of things on Tuesday with the uh, couple important numbers out of the Eurozone, including inflation, banking sector conditions, and of course, um, as we move into Wednesday, that Fed decision. But Thursday is the ECB decision. That's really important. And then, of course, jobs data coming out on Friday wither the economy. Um, we are going to see that Fed decision beforehand. But of course, the Fed officials have a lot of data to parse that they've gotten over the last couple of weeks, too. All right. Simone, thanks very much for the round. Simone Foxman uh, giving us what we need to know this morning about uh, the markets. Joining us for further discussion, Eddie Vandervault, Bloomberg Markets Live strategist. And Eddie, you know, before we get to any of the other stories, I've got to bring up this uh, you know, really financial stability uh, issue. First Republic, another bank bites the dust here. That's four in the past couple of months in the U.S. And this one, you could have seen it coming a mile away. The FDIC has to take it into receivership, which they didn't want to do. Um, and then eventually uh, they'll pass it over to J.P. Morgan. What does this mean for markets, you know, beyond uh, just California banks? Yeah, as you say, this is a big deal, right? It's the fourth bank uh, that, that 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 bites the dust, as it were. But but the remarkable thing is just how much markets are taking that in their stride. We are not seeing significant fallout from this. In fact, broad banking shares in the U.S. Uh, closed up on Friday uh, when it was clear that this was going to happen over the weekend. And and it, we just do not see any risk of, of contagion. The market's assumption at the moment is that this is the last. Uh, the last uh, the last domino to fall, as it were, and, and that, that there just won't be any contagion. Well, we did have Charlie Munger warning, um, I think he had an interview with an Australian paper, um, that, you know, a lot of these banks hold way too much commercial, uh, commercial real estate mortgage assets, and that's the next shoe we were waiting to drop. This was more of a, like, uh, rich people in the Hamptons uh, real estate mortgage right. assets. So it's it's a different kettle of fish. Are you, are you not worried that we could see other banks come down as, you know, return to office didn't happen as much as people yeah. may have wished? And, and a lot of uh, companies are looking at commercial real estate as a way to cut costs? Yeah, look, I think that is exactly right. I think there is a lot of risk still to banks, but there isn't a lot of risk to banks from First Republic failing, right? I think the risk to banks broadly is of a larger, gotcha. what, what Munja pointed at was a, was, a, was a larger drawdown in property prices. And if we see that, then sure, we, we, you know, we almost certainly will see more bank failures. But I don't think the market thinks that there will be immediate impact from this event. So as long as the economy stays roughly where it is now, why not uh, have, a, have another look at banks which look like good value unless we see that big drawdown in property I mean, price? They, they look like good value, right? But typically in a U.S. banking crisis, 
In my lifetime and yours, there's been one man who stepped in to save the day, right? Warren Buffett usually <laughs> rears his beautiful head when we need him in times like this. And we haven't heard of Ber Berkshire Hathaway coming to the rescue of any of these banks. We also get, as I mentioned with Simone, Berkshire Hathaway earnings at the end of the week. And your colleague on the MLive team, Ven Rahm, has written uh, an eye-catching headline, Buffett offers market-beating returns in a recession. Um, I guess we're all waiting for the Oracle of Omaha. Yeah, absolutely. And he's steering clear of the banks, as you say. Uh, and the market likes it. The market says, look, we think, so we, we had this survey uh, last week. We asked uh, market uh, participants what they think Mark uh, Buffett's returns are going to be this year. And most of them think that he's going to be, beat the market. But but that's not surprising, given that most people expe expect some sort of a U.S. recession and value outperforms in a recession. There's also a little bit of a Buffett premium in that price, though, uh, according to our survey respondents, not as much as people expect. But certainly, Mark Buffett always makes for good headlines over the weekends. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before that, of course, we're going to get the Fed decision on Wednesday. Then we get the ECB decision. I guess from the Fed, 25 basis points is baked in. From the ECB, it's still kind of up in the air, isn't it? Yeah, we got a, little, a lot of data to come in for the ECB. As you say, for the Fed, one and done. For the ECB, there could be as much as three, three rate hikes. The market is pricing still. Um, and that's because, you know, inflation still is running hot. This, it is because the European economy is strong and the economy can 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 withstand it. But the the, the under the underlying reason why they have to hike is because they're seeing a lot of uh, inflation still. But there is a lot of base effects coming through. Those energy prices that we saw run run up last year. Some of that will start to fade this year. So so as you say, we're getting we're getting uh, a lot of data this week, including some inflation data that will give us a clue whether the ECB will have to go and price uh, those those rate cuts or deliver on, the, on those priced rate cuts. All right. So a lot uh -huh. going on this week. Eddie, thanks very much. We'll continue to keep checking out your work on the MLive blog. And of course, I listen to you on Bloomberg Radio every morning with Carolyn Hepker and Stephen Carroll as well. Eddie Vandervault there of the MLive team. Now coming up, Matt Maley, chief market strategist at Miller Tayback joins us. We'll get his take on all of this market action, potential market action amid all, amidst all of this breaking news. Um, also, what does the takeover of First Republic mean for other regional lenders? Really, we should say receivership and then takeover because it happened as the FDIC didn't exactly want it to. We'll get insight from Bloomberg intelligence analyst Herman Chan. Plus, Canada's trade strategy, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, China, and the Inflation Reduction Act. We'll talk about those things um, with him in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg coming up. Yes, the IRA is something that we've had to step up to to make sure we're competitive, but uh, we're going to be a lot more strategic about how we you know, pick and choose the right investments. We can't just do it blanket like the U.S. can. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's Simone Foxman with the first word. Simone? Thanks, Matt. Russia targeted Ukrainian cities with cruise missiles early today. Ukraine's military says 15 out of 18 of them were shot down. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Zelensky spoke with France's President Emmanuel Macron. Macron's office says they discussed Europe's coordination of military aid to be able to respond to Ukraine's needs. In Sudan, the army and paramilitary force it's fighting have agreed to extend a truce for 72 hours. There's been international pressure to let civilians safely leave the combat areas. Water and food are becoming hard to find in Sudan cities. House Republicans are challenging the Senate to pass its own debt limit bill. They're trying to increase pressure on President Biden to hold talks on spending cuts they've linked to an increase in the U.S. borrowing limit. The president has insisted the two topics shouldn't be combined. The U.S. runs the risk of defaulting on payments as early as June. And new economic data show that China's recovery remains patchy. The latest indicators point to a contraction in manufacturing. Still, consumers splurged as the country began a five-day holiday. And the housing market continues to rebound. And you know what strikes me about this, Matt, is just that we've seen this difference in the Chinese recovery between the consumer 
and what's happening, you know, in manufacturing sector, that's been right. the overall theme, and that's not going anywhere, it seems. Yeah, and it really hasn't helped in terms of signaling um, demand for crude, right? We had the, the weak uh, factory data, manufacturing data, and that brought the price of oil down. Uh, Brent, of course, as well, being the global benchmark. Um, then we had this great spending data heading into this week, uh, this holiday, and that hasn't helped to boost the crude price. So even after that, um, you know, shock production cut from OPEC Plus, now I guess it's almost a month ago, um, we really haven't seen prices pick up, it, with the exception of the initial jump to like $85 a barrel, right? Yeah, that's right. And I, you know, overall, these concerns about global demand just continuing to be the overarching force here. Yes, OPEC wants to keep these oil prices higher, particularly Saudi Arabia, to kind of fund its economic transition. But it's very hard to be able to do this when you have uh, overall weak demand. And clearly, I think consumers reacting to the idea that, you know, manufacturing is what keeps up the Chinese economy, much less so uh, things like consumer demand. Is the drop in manufacturing, Simone, a uh, result of reshoring or friendshoring, which the U.S. and other major Western economies are doing, pulling manufacturing, I don't know, really out of China as much as putting it um, in other places? It could be and could be. We've seen so many companies move increasingly to, to start operations in India. I think Apple had a big uh, push there as well. Um, but I think overall the message is there's a real risk to uh, China's ongoing economic uh, resumption. That's certainly the message out from Bloomberg Intelligence as well as economists really across the board. Well, it definitely seems to have... Um, uh, I guess softened increases in commodity prices to the extent that we've seen them at all. Simone Foxman, thanks very much for that. Coming up, we'll talk about this and, and much more with Matt Maley. He is the chief market strategist over at Miller Tabak. We'll get his thoughts on the failure of First Republic as the FDIC takes the bank into receivership and we'll pass it on later to JP Morgan. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Regulators take over First Republic. They will sell it to J.P. Morgan Chase later. Rescue efforts couldn't fix the damage caused by bad investments and depositor runs. Apple tops the list of companies reporting earnings this week. Analysts are waiting to see whether the world's most valuable public company sold more iPhones than expected. And uh, we're waiting on the Fed's next move. The central bank will announce its latest decision on interest rates Wednesday. Friday's jobs reports, though, after that could give us a hint of what is still to come. I'm Matt Miller here in New York. Anna Edwards is off for the, uh, the May Day holiday. Let's get a quick check on what's going on in markets. After we rallied up into the close on Friday, even with concerns about First Republic, um, we're not doing a heck of a lot in terms of futures uh, today. And it's kind of a mixed picture. You see uh, Dow Jones Industrial Futures rising, NASDAQ futures falling, and S&P futures basically unchanged right here. We did close uh, up at 41.69 in the cash trade on Friday. Investors are selling bonds, and so the yield is floating up another 3.5%. Right now we're looking at 345.79 on the 10 year. So maybe that means investors are feeling a little bit better about the economy going forward. On the other hand, a rising yield here um, causes a little bit of competition with equities. This is something that we'll touch on with Matt Maley over at Miller Tayback in just a moment. NYMEX crude down another $1.68. The concern here is the Chinese, I don't want to say consumer, I'll say economy, because the consumer in China looks uh, pretty good from the data points we got out over the weekend, spending more money into this Labor Day holiday. Manufacturing, on the other hand, unexpectedly contracted in April. So that's a concern for 
uh, the Chinese economy and use of fuel. Bitcoin is down probably on the correlation with, I told you, NASDAQ futures are off, and Bitcoin tends to be more correlated with the uh, technology stocks. It's a drop of about 700 and change to $28,620. Really, the focus right now is on First Republic because the precipitous falls that we witnessed last week um, would have probably caused even more um, depositors to pull money. As a result, the FDIC is taking First Republic into receivership and will then sell it to J.P. Morgan. So you can see First Republic shares down another 43%. The bank is worth now less than $400 million in total. J.P. Morgan Chase is the bidder that won the auction um, to buy this bank out of receivership from the FDIC. We're still waiting on a lot of details um, here, especially in terms of the bids that we saw from, I know that J.P. Morgan, as well as PNC and Citizens, uh, Bank America and U.S. Bank Corp were all invited to bid. Bank America and U.S. Bank Corp are two, at least that I know, declined to take part in that auction. Um, but I'm sure that more details will continue to roll out as this is really hot off the presses. This is news that just crossed the wire a couple of hours ago. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, this whole situation with Matt Maley, chief market strategist over at Miller Tayback. Matt, great to have you with us uh, on, a, on a morning that's packed with news. Um, one of the main questions I have is, do we see any contagion here or any further concerns about regional banks? Because, you know, for a while, it wasn't clear whether the FDIC was going to, and I guess it's really still not clear exactly how they're going to deal um, with all the deposits that were above and beyond the insurance limit. Yeah, I mean, it's there, there certainly raises more concerns. I mean, we don't really see it in the marketplace, though. So, like, gosh, on Friday when, uh, uh, when, when, of course, First Republic was, good, was getting hit, not as hard as it is today, but still getting hit quite hard, the KRE, the, the, the uh, regional bank at ETF, actually rallied. Uh, so people are, are, are becoming a lot more comfortable about the systemic issues. Uh, but what about the, uh, uh, at some point soon, I think people are going to understand that the, the economic uh, situation is definitely a, not a good one. I mean, we, the, these banks are going to pull, pull on their horns. I mean, you can't get a, I mean, for all practical purposes, there are no new uh, commercial real estate loans being made in this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, as credit contracts, we already had an economy that, that's slowing. Uh, whenever credit contracts in a material way, that has a negative impact on, on the economy. And, and at some point, uh, uh, you know, I think it's going to have a bigger impact on the markets than it has so far. What, what, is this, uh, what does this mean for the Fed? Of course, coming out on Wednesday, um, I don't think that they'll be too worried about the slowdown in U.S. economic growth as they try and rein in inflation, but they must be concerned about financial stability. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, that's the one thing that the, the people, we keep hearing people talk about, geez, if the Fed makes a mistake, the, the stock market could, could fall into a recession. I I think they've made it pre pretty evident is that, you know, especially before this whole uh, financial issue uh, came up, that they were less worried about the economy because they felt uh, that the, uh, or less worried about uh, forcing the economy to fall into recession uh, because they felt that if they uh, if they didn't fight inflation, the recession would be worse down the road. This financial uh, stability issue, of course, has changed things a little bit. And of course, they they did add some uh, emergency liquidity into the system uh, last month. Uh, that helped buoy the markets. I mean, let's face it: when was the last time the market went up seven percent? When when uh, we're in the middle of a mini banking crisis. Uh, but uh, so it's going to be very very interesting to see how they they uh, portray the whole situation. Uh, if they you know say that the, the situation with the banks is stable, the financial system is stable, uh, and but inflation is still sticky. Uh, we could get a, a little bit of a, 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 a hawkish surprise this week. Well, we'll have to see. And, uh, I mean, does it mean that they're done is, is my question, or could we see another rate hike later? And I guess maybe even more importantly, Matt, what happens to quantitative tightening? Are we still in, involved in that? Is the Fed going to continue that? You know, it's 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 uh, it's funny because whenever they do make a change, they usually telegraph it well uh, well in advance. And you know, going into the quiet period ten days ago or, or seven days ago now, uh, about a week ago, uh, they uh, 
Uh, they hadn't you know, signaled that at all. If anything, they said, no, we're going to stick with QT. Uh, and that, again, that drains the liquidity out of the, out of the system. And, and the, let's, you know, the market definitely, uh, the stock market anyway, uh, and, and the bond market for that matter, uh, definitely rallied in a big way because of added liquidity from 2000 uh, through two, uh, 2020, I'm sorry, uh, through 2021. And the, the removal of that liquidity in 2022 is what hurt the market. If they're going to stay with QT, uh, even, even if if they uh, pause on their interest rates, uh, less liquidity, that's going to be tough for risk assets. Does the bond market, I mean, after this decision, is it time to start buying bonds rather than selling them? Will we see rates come down considerably? Uh, you know, I, I, we could, I mean, and probably should. Again, assuming, and if, if I'm correct, and the economy does uh, slow down quite a bit, uh, and you know that will uh, lead the uh, you know obviously uh, people be less worried about uh, uh, I'm sorry be more concerned about the the economy, and therefore uh, uh, interest rates should come down. The one thing that people get confused though a little bit is that when long term interest rates come down, that's usually good for the stock market. And unless we're headed into recession, we go back to the last 40 years mm. is that interest rates going up hurt the stock market. But then when people realize that uh, that they're going to recession and interest rates start to long term interest rates head down, the stock market, the, the stock market and the bond market, I'm sorry, uh, bond yields and stocks fall in tandem instead of going in opposite directions. So it's something to be very careful. about. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Matt, um, yeah. if this is the Fed's last rate hike, you know, even if we're going into a recession, expectedly mild, um, do you want to be a buyer of this stock market when the Fed's done raising rates typically or historically, it has been a pretty good sign? Well, yes, overall, but th those numbers are a little bit skewed, par partially because the in 2006, when they stopped raising rates, uh, the market just took off, you know, uh, and, and formed an incredible bubble uh, over the next 18 months to, or 12 to 18 months. Uh, the thing is, though, what, again, when you're when when you have a situation where the market is still overvalued, usually when the Fed stops raising rates, the market has become cheap. In this case, it's still overvalued, just like it was in May of 2000. Uh, May of 2000. I mean, back then, uh, the Fed stopped, you know, made, did their pause, stopped raising interest rates. And of course, over the next day, two, two years, the stock market got absolutely crushed. Uh, now, again, I'm not looking for that kind of a, mm. a, a, a scenario repeat to where the market was down 50 percent. But my, my, my point is that just because the Fed pauses, it doesn't always mean that the stock market uh, rallies. In fact, there are some cases where it's done just the opposite. That's a good and important point to make, Matt, and we appreciate it. Matt Maley there of Miller Tayback giving us his insights uh, early on a Monday morning ahead of so much to come in terms of earnings, in terms of the Fed, in terms of economic data. And of course, amidst the most important story for us at this moment, JP Morgan wins the bid for First Republic, but not until after the FDIC had to take that bank into receivership, sucking up a lot of losses, possibly more than $10 billion. More on what this might mean for other regional banks next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You are looking live at the principal room. It is empty right now, but a little bit later, Apollo CEO Mark Rowan will come through the door and we'll interview him at 10 a.m. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York. Anna Edwards is off for the May 1st holiday in the U.K. Now, back here in the U.S., the country's largest bank has become even larger. J.P. Morgan won the bidding to acquire First Republic Bank after it was taken over by regulators following uh, a bad investment and a run on deposits. Right now, Herman Chan is in the studio with us. He's Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for U.S. Regional Banks. And there are many, many more questions we have, Herman. Um, above and beyond the few lines that we got just a couple of hours ago. I mean, this story is so fresh. Uh, one thing we do know, you were just telling me during the commercial break, is that all of the depositors' uh, 
money will will be available for withdrawal. So right. I think about 50% of the deposits were above and beyond the FDIC's typical $250,000 insurance limit, but they're going to honor all of it again. Correct. So there's $92 billion of deposits left um, that J.P. Morgan's assuming, and, and any depositor, commercial, you know, retail customer can go into their prior uh, First Republic branch, now a J.P. Morgan branch, and, and, and take the money out as they so please. So J.P. Morgan will assume everything now. Mm -hmm. I guess that means they'll they'll be responsible, as you said, for paying out all the deposits, mm -hmm. and uh, they will assume all of the assets that First Republic had. I think it was around two hundred and thirty billion dollars. In total, it's around the last round time numbers two hundred. The last time dollars. they were valued, right? right? But if you mark them to market now, right. it's much less than that, isn't it? That's right. So this is what's interesting with the deal, and probably why J.P. Morgan won the auction is that they're assuming all of the underwater securities and all the loans that are now worth less because of rising interest rates. So my my assumption is that the regional banks that were also bidding probably didn't want all of the assets. So with J.P. Morgan taking on everything, it does lessen the potential loss for the FDIC and hence the J.P. Morgan being the winning bid. So if, if you have an asset that's worth, um, you know, 100000 but you owe 100000 and you give me both of those uh, credits and liabilities, mm -hmm. um, do you also have to give me the extra money that makes up for the... I mean, for example, those assets are now worth 70000 Do you right. have to give me thirty grand as well? Well, they're going to absorb the paper loss, and once those... J.P. Morgan uh, absorbs the right. paper loss, and, and then the once, FDIC pays them back? J.P. Morgan can just wait until those loans or, or securities mature, and, and then they'll be made whole. It's just a matter of waiting for that time to happen, which could take you know, 5, 10, 15 years for, for it to actually get back to that original par value. I'm just wondering what kind of hit the FDIC is going to actually take after mm -hmm. this, and how it's going to work mechanically. I guess the... Second part of that question, we really don't know the answer to yet, right? Right. We're, we should hear more details on the call. J.P. Morgan's having a call later this morning, so we'll hear more on that front. Uh, the FDIC did say that the, the loss that they're taking for, to the insurance fund is about $13 billion, and that compares much less uh, versus the SVB hit that was $20 billion. So it is a better deal for, for the regulators to, to transact with J.P. Morgan. So in terms of... Um, the potential contagion here. Mm -hmm. Are we no longer concerned? Are there no other banks out there that have, you know, a massive amounts of uninsured deposits and some very bad investments on their books? Well, going through the first quarter earnings, we did not see any other bank lose 40% of their deposits like, like First Republic did. So, you know, on average, in, in my coverage universe of regional banks, it was about 2-3% decline, which is really normal in, in, the cer in this uh, circumstance, given the fact that we're at higher interest rates and there's other high-yielding um, alternatives to move your money to. Um, I would say that, uh, that there's still risk out there, given the fact that the banks may, uh, may still face you know, issues with commercial real estate, particularly an office CRE, uninsured deposits, what happens there, and, and capital ratios may be a little light if you adjust for the unrealized losses in the securities book. So there's still some concerns in the marketplace, but we're not seeing that deposit flight um, compared to what we saw at First Republic. Yet. Yet. Uh, I wonder, um, well, maybe we won't, and that, so this immediate uh, problem is solved. Mm -hmm. The bigger picture issue, I guess, now is moral hazard, right? Because right. I have no reason um, to, you know, keep two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less at a regional bank. Every time one of them fails, the FDIC gives all of us all of our money back. Right. Yeah. That's that's something I think. Uh the, the, there needs to be more clarity on it. If, if we're not, not going to have that blanket guarantee, um, does does it create more risk for the regional banks and does deposits eventually flee out and go to the larger banks like J.P. Morgan well, over time? And then the biggest bank, the biggest problem is the biggest bank, right? J.P. Yeah. Morgan now holds more than 10% right. of total U.S. deposits. Right. Are we putting too many of our eggs in one banking basket? Yeah, that's, that's the thing. We... We were under the impression that J.P. Morgan wouldn't be allowed to bid or eventually acquire a bank like First Republic, given their over the 10% uh, deposit cap. Um, usually, the regulators would allow this under special circumstances. So I guess we're under special circumstances at this point. All right. Herman Chan is uh, a man whom you're going to see a lot more of today.
And you'll hear him a lot on Bloomberg Radio, I'm sure, uh, every couple of hours as well. Very busy um, the last few months, and he continues to be the most wanted analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. So thank you very much. Coming up, Justin Trudeau says Canada needs to be careful about when to cooperate with China and when to compete with them. Part of our exclusive interview with the Canadian Prime Minister next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York. Anna Edwards is off for the May 1st holiday in the UK. Let's take a look at what's coming up on this very busy week. Starting today, Bloomberg TV and radio will be live from the Milken Global Conference in Los Angeles. Our team will bring you interviews with the biggest and most influential names in business and finance. Apple headlines another busy week of earnings that includes results from European banks, car makers, and energy giants. Though they come at the end of the week, we're going to get 162 companies out of the S&P 500 this week. Interest rate decisions will continue to be in focus. The RBA decides on Tuesday. We get the big one on Wednesday. The Fed comes out with its rates decision, and then the ECB follows on Thursday. And the U.S. jobs report on Friday will give a sense of how labor demand is holding up. The projected 180,000 increase in April payrolls is seen as healthy, although it would mark the third straight month of decelerating employment growth. Now let's get to a Bloomberg exclusive. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sat down for a wide-ranging interview with Bloomberg's David Weston. Here's what he said about Canada's approach to China. We have seen uh, over the years uh, China not hesitating to use uh, its trade leverage for geopolitical gains. Uh, and that is something that we have to be very, very mindful about. Uh, and the pandemic taught us that resilience and, and reliance on friends and places that share our values for essential inputs to the economy we're building uh, it's really important what we've seen around semiconductors, uh, what we're seeing around the fact that all of our uh, lithium in the world pretty much comes through China now. It doesn't have to be that way, and that's why uh, we're building that resilience, not just for ourselves, but for American friends, for European friends, for people who uh, are willing to, uh, uh, to buy our lithium and not want to, uh, to be entirely wrapped up on parts of the world that are less reliable, as Europe understood when uh, Russia turned off the taps for oil and gas. We've watched the Biden administration work its way through an approach to China that both uh, really protects national interests, including national security interests, but at the same time does have some economic relationship with them. What is the Canadian approach to that? Are there things actually that the United States could learn from that? Well, uh, one of the things that that we have to be around China is extremely clear-eyed. There are areas where we can and should be engaging and working together. And a good example of that was uh, Canada just hosted the Nature COP, COP15 in December in Montreal, alongside China, where we came out with some very ambitious targets for protecting biodiversity around the world, 30 percent uh, by 2030. These are good things that you can do together. But there's other areas where we're going to have to absolutely compete and even challenge China uh, on the economic spheres. And there are other places where we're going to have to actively contest China on human rights, on, on you know, labor standards, on uh, how they're engaging with different places around the world. We need to be thoughtful uh, and solid and predictable, but very firm on our values. That was Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's David Weston. Let's take a look at what's going on in banking shares right now after the news that First Republic was taken into receivership by the FDIC and will be sold then to J.P. Morgan. Uh, right now we see First Republic shares, which obviously tanked last week and are down 97 percent year to date, down another 40 percent in the pre-market. So down to two dollars and 12 cents in the pre-market, bringing the market cap of that bank to just 400 million. Um, we will get continue to get details out of the J.P. Morgan Chase agreement. Hopefully, J.P. Morgan's shares are up two and a third percent right now. We know that uh, the FDIC invited a number of other bidders, PNC and Citizen as well, are two 
that potentially bid and didn't win the business. So PNC shares are down about 3%. In terms of the broader market right now, we do see the S&P 500 futures um, unchanged as Dow futures rise and NASDAQ futures fall. So it looks like it's going to be a more difficult day for tech stocks than it will for the big blue chips. The U.S. 10-year yield is rising 3.5% as investors let go of that debt. 345.60 is the level right now. And we also see NYMEX crude continuing to fall down 158 at $75.20 a barrel, even after positive economic news coming out of China. That's it for Early Edition. Surveillance, the OG, is up next. We'll hear from Lori Calvacina of RBC, among others. This is Bloomberg.